Greetings. This is the second lecture on the Ries representation theorem. We concluded the first lecture by stating Urishon's lemma, which is the main topological auxiliary result needed in the proof of the Ries representation theorem. In Urishon's lemma and throughout this lecture, we assume that x tau is a locally compact Hausdorff space. We are given a compact set k and an open set u such that u contains k. The task is to construct a continuous function f whose support is compact and contained in u, who takes values between 0 and 1, and equals 1 on the set k. The construction of f will somehow involve upper and lower semi-continuous functions, which we briefly introduced at the end of the previous lecture. The only facts we will need about these functions were listed on this page. Notably, characteristic functions of open sets are lower semi-continuous, and characteristic functions of closed sets are upper semi-continuous. We then begin the proof of Urizon's lemma. Here we once again list the properties of the function f we need to achieve. Before defining such a function f, we will apply lemma 2.8 from the previous lecture multiple times in fact, countably many times. This lemma stated that, given the sets k and u, as in Urizon's lemma, we can find an open set v which contains k, and whose compact closure is contained in u. For every rational number q inside the closed unit interval, we will find one such set denoted here by uq. This property is called star in the sequel. Moreover, we want to choose the sets u, q in such a way that they have something to do with each other. Namely, if p and q are distinct rational numbers, with q larger than p, we want to ensure that the closure of u, q is contained in u, p. In other words, sets with larger indices are compactly contained inside sets with smaller indices. This property is denoted by double star. While the property star follows immediately from lemma 2.8, it's less clear if property double star can even be arranged. This will require a short inductive argument, which we discuss next. We will denote 0 by q1 and 1 by q2. The remaining rational numbers inside the open unit interval are then enumerated in some arbitrary order as q3, q4, and so on. We now start by applying lemma 2.8 twice. We choose sets u0 and u1, or in other words uq1 and uq2, in such a way that k is contained in u1, whose closure is contained in u0, whose closure is further contained in u. The closures here are compact. This can be easily achieved by first finding the set u0 between k and u, and then finding the set u1 between k and u0. It is now clear that both properties star and double star are valid at least for the two rational numbers 0 and 1. The set with the larger index is compactly contained inside the set with the smaller index. Let us then assume inductively that the sets uq1, uq2 through to uqn have already been constructed for some index n no smaller than 2. We of course assume that the properties star and double star are satisfied by the sets constructed so far, and our task will be to construct the set u, q, n plus 1. Given the rational number q, n plus 1, we locate two specific rational numbers q, i and q, j, whose indices i and j lie between 1 and n. Namely, qi should be the largest among these finitely many numbers, which is still smaller than qn plus 1. Similarly, qj should be the smallest number, 
which is still larger than qn plus 1. Note that in particular qi is smaller than qj, so the set uqj is compactly contained inside uqi by the property double star. Consequently, by another application of lemma 2.8, we can squeeze a new open set uqn plus 1 between the closure of uqj and uqi. Then it is clear that both properties star and double star remain valid for all the sets constructed up to this point, including uqn plus 1. This completes the inductive construction of the sets uq. Here is, once again, a reminder of the properties of the open sets uq. We will now use these sets to construct the function f. In fact, for each rational number q, as above, we first define two auxiliary functions, fq and gq. The function fq is defined as the characteristic function of uq multiplied by q. You should note that when q gets closer to 1, the sets uq get smaller and smaller. So the function f1 equals 1 on a fairly small set, and f half equals half on a slightly larger set, and so on. As the other extreme case, f0 is identically 0. The function gq is defined to equal 1 on the closure of uq and q on the complement of the closure. It is evident that the function gq is no smaller than fq. For example, if you look at both functions on uq, you see that fq equals q, which is a rational number between 0 and 1, and gq equals 1. Before moving on, let's observe that each function fq is lower semicontinuous, and each function gq is upper semicontinuous. For fq, this is clear, since fq is just a weighted characteristic function of an open set. For gq, you may need to pause for a moment. The reason for the upper semicontinuity is that gq takes only two values, and it takes the larger of them, namely 1, on a closed set. So, in this regard, gq behaves just like the characteristic function of a closed set. Next, we finally define the function f we are aiming for, as the supremum of the functions fq. In addition, we define the auxiliary function g as the infimum of the functions gq. While it was clear that fq is smaller than gq, it is no longer so immediate that f is smaller than g. However, this turns out to be true. Some other things are still clear. First of all, both f and g only take values between 0 and 1. Second, f is lower semicontinuous, as the supremum of lower semicontinuous functions, and g is upper semicontinuous, as the infimum of upper semicontinuous functions. The point of defining these two functions is that, next, we will show that they are actually the same function, f equals g. Then this function is simultaneously upper and lower semicontinuous, and hence continuous. Before proving the equality of f and g, let's check that this function also satisfies the other requirements of Urison's lemma. First, we claim that f equals 1 on the set k. This is easy, recalling that f is the supremum of the functions q times the characteristic function of uq. In particular, f is no smaller than the function 1 times the characteristic function of u1, and this function already exceeds the characteristic function of k, since k is contained in u1. On the other hand, we also claim that the support of f is compactly contained inside the set u. This is simply because of the nested property of the sets uq. They were all contained in the set u0, and the set u0 was also chosen to be compactly contained inside u. Therefore, the support of each fq is contained in the closure of u0, and the same is true of f. 
We have now shown that f satisfies all the claimed properties except possibly continuity. This will follow once we show that f equals g. Let's start with the estimate which may sound easier, namely that f is bounded from above by g. As a quick reminder, here are again the definitions of gq and g. The function gq equal to 1 on the closure of uq and q on its complement. The function g was defined as the infimum of the functions gq. Now let's make the counter assumption that fx is strictly larger than gx for some point x in x. Then we can find two rational numbers p and q from the unit interval so that also fq at x strictly exceeds gp at x. We already mentioned earlier that this would be impossible if p is the same as q, but now there is no guarantee of that. We can still say something useful about the relation between p and q. Recall that fq only takes the two values 0 and q, and gp only takes the two values p and 1. So if fq is anywhere larger than gp, like in our scenario, it must be the case that q is strictly larger than p. Now we are in good shape. Since q is strictly larger than p, the set uq is contained in up by the property double star. And just looking at the definition of gp, we know that gp is at least as large as the characteristic function of up. Since up now contains uq, this is further bounded from below by the characteristic function of uq. Finally, this function is bounded from below by fq. We conclude that, after all, gp of x is no smaller than fq of x. This contradiction shows that f is bounded from above by g. It remains to prove the more surprising inequality, namely that f is bounded from below by g. Let's again start with a counterassumption. There exists a point x in x so that f of x is strictly smaller than g of x. In this case, we can find two rational numbers p and q between fx and gx such that p is strictly smaller than q. We claim that x can't lie in up and x has to lie in the closure of uq. Indeed, if the first claim fails, thus x in up, then f of x exceeds fp of x exceeds p. Similarly, if the second claim fails and x doesn't lie in the closure of uq, then g of x is no larger than gq of x, which is bounded from above by q. In both cases, the choices of p and q would be violated and the proof of the claim is complete. On the other hand, the rational numbers p and q were chosen so that q is strictly larger than p. This implies by the property double star that the closure of uq is contained in up. Therefore, what we just established in the claim is not possible, namely that the point x would lie in the closure of uq, but still not in up. This contradiction shows that f is bounded from below by g. We have now shown that f equals g, and the proof of Urison's lemma is complete. We close these notes with a useful corollary of Urison's lemma. Namely, the lemma allows us to construct something called partitions of unity in locally compact Hausdorff spaces. Informally speaking, a partition of unity is some way of decomposing the function 1 into a sum of other typically continuous functions. This is a very common trick in analysis, and you will soon see it applied during the proof of the Ries representation theorem. As we mentioned, in locally compact Hausdorff spaces, partitions of unity can be constructed with the help of Urison's lemma. The precise statement is theorem 2.12. As usual, let x tau be a locally compact Hausdorff space 
and let U1, U2 through to Un be a finite open cover of a compact set K contained in X. Then there exist corresponding real-valued functions H1, H2 through to Hn, defined on X, with the following two properties. First, each function Hi only takes values between 0 and 1, and has a compact support contained in Ui. Second, the sum of the functions Hi also takes values between 0 and 1, and it takes the value 1 on the set K. If there was only one set ui, then the statement is literally nothing but Urison's lemma. So you can view this theorem as a generalization of Urison's lemma. It is common terminology to say that the family of functions h1 through to hn is a continuous partition of unity on k subordinate to the cover u1 through to un. We will also use this terminology on the next lectures. We then start the proof. Fix a point x in k, so also x in ui for at least one index i. If there are many options, just pick one freely. According to lemma 2.8, we can find an open set vx with compact closure such that x is contained in vx and the closure of vx is contained in ui. Now the sets Vx form an open cover of the compact set K, so we can pick a finite subcover Vx1, Vx2 through to Vxn for certain points x1 through to xm in K. Of course there is no guarantee that the index m would be the same as the index n, which was the number of the sets ui. We would actually like these indices to be the same, and partially for that reason we define the following sets hj for all indices j between 1 and n. The set hj is the union of the closures of the sets vxi, which are contained in uj. You should pay attention that both indices i and j appear in this definition. There may easily be several sets of the form vxi whose closures are contained in uj. The situation is illustrated in the figure on the right. For example, the set U1 here contains the closures of both Vx2 and Vx3, and hence H1 consists of the union of these two closures. We have now defined the sets Hj for each index j between 1 and n. Each Hj is a compact subset of Uj. Moreover, k is contained in the union of the sets Hj, because this union contains the union of all the sets Vxi. We next apply Urison's lemma separately to each pair of the sets Hj and Uj. The conclusion is that there exists a continuous function Gj, whose support is compactly contained in Uj, which only takes values between 0 and 1, and which equals 1 on the set Hj. These functions gj would already satisfy part of our claims. The remaining problem will be to control the sum of the functions gj, which might be too large at the moment. We define the functions hj as follows. We simply set h1 to equal g1. Then we define h2 to equal 1 minus g1 multiplied by g2. We continue in the same fashion. The function hn is eventually defined to be the product of all the functions 1 minus gj for indices j between 1 and n minus 1 times the function gn. Many of the good properties of the functions gj are inherited by the functions hj. First, each hj is a continuous function whose support is compact and contained in uj. Also, the functions hj only take values between 0 and 1. Additionally, we have some good news about the sum of the functions hj. By an easy induction, you can check that the sum of the functions hj can be expressed as 1 minus the product of all the functions 1 minus gj, 
where j runs from 1 to n. The product term only takes values between 0 and 1, so we see that the sum of the functions hj also takes values between 0 and 1. Finally, we observe that the sum equals 1 on the set k. Indeed, if x is a point from k, then we can find an index j between 1 and n, such that x lies in hj. And this means that the corresponding function gj equals 1 at x. Hence, 1 minus gj of x equals 0. If you look at the formula for the sum of the functions hj above, this implies that the sum equals 1 at the point x. We have now shown that the functions hj satisfy all the claims of the theorem and the proof is complete. And this concludes all the topological preliminaries needed to prove the Ries representation theorem. We will state the theorem precisely 